morning, good afternoon, good night, guys. We are here, and I'm Lauren from Uncommons. And today we want to present some design advocates in Asia. Oh, wait a minute. Okay, can you see my screen now? Um. Yeah. So let's give a brief introduction to Uncommons and myself. So Uncommons is a public sphere where a collective of public goods builders explores critical thoughts together. So design is an a very important scope we keep exploring, and uh, myself is an operator at Uncommons, and I'm also a design enthusiast. Um. So. Why Uncommons is a um, design advocator? Actually, back in 2022, we are one of the Asia donators in design feature round. And at that time, uh, those design pioneers like Molecule Labs, like Protocol Labs, like Vitalik, are uh, all the donators in this round. Um, later in 2022, we also held a lot of uh, you know, talks in design. We talk about the history of design, the molecule particle, and beta dot lab dot, and also the peer review mechanisms. And by all these talking, uh, talks and sharings, we attracted many, uh, community community members who are interested in design. And Swift is one of them. And um, yeah, and on August, uh, twenty twenty three, he started. Design Asia. So next session, he will introduce some um, design development in Asia in twenty twenty three. So Swift, Swift, would you like to introduce yourself a little bit and start your session? We are another growth on uh, design and connect with the world. Thank you. Okay, thank you for Swift. And that's an overview of uh, the design development in Asia. And next part will be a, a Q&A session. And we want to start it with two design experts I met in Istanbul. Uh, so, uh, Jose and Josh, are you there? Yeah, 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 I can hear you now. So maybe we can start by a very brief self-introduction. <laughs> yeah, so what about Jose? You can just briefly introduce your experience in design and we can start a Q&A session. Uh, to to solve scientific problems related to the production system. Okay, thank you. So, what about Josh? Would you like to? Yeah. Uh. Do, uh. Wow. Yeah, we can see you now. <laughs> So we're including uh, a number of tools for the DSI space. So we're doing information aggregation. We're doing uh, in-person events, a lot of social work to evangelize DSI. And we're also building a, a technical product to build a primitive unit of knowledge, which will allow people to uh, create and, dis and disseminate their information, their knowledge, whilst getting incentivized at a, in a sort of brand new fashion. And the reason I came into DSI was this exact, re this is this exact reason, right? Which is the dissemination of information and knowledge having a lot of blockers on it in today's world, right? And so we need to find ways to essentially, originally it was just for research funding. That's why I started this platform, but it's sort of uh, evolved into something quite a bit more rich, which is about what is the knowledge? What is the information that we're actually creating? Like how, how do we value that? How do we quantify that? And so really open to uh, like some interesting questions about what what DSI really means for, for science and for innovation, for publishing, for research, for incentives um it, we're hoping that it's going to be a big change rather than just sort of 
a sort of slight improvement on the current system. It's going to be an entirely new version of that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. By the way, the uh, design landscape analysis mentioned before, it, one of the authors also came from uh, Design World. Yeah, that's a very uh, amazing works. So maybe we can start our questions uh, session. Uh, sorry, this question has, has an update. Maybe you can help. So first question is, um, so for Josh, so what motivates you to build Design World? And what are the most challenging things on your design journey? So maybe the first part you have answer a little bit and you can focus on the second part. innovation in this direction is is sensible right um a lot of the time uh, a lot of the time a lot of uh, you know scientists are all about innovation they're all about progress they're all about um evolution but at the same time they are creatures of habit often and don't really feel comfortable utilizing these new tools or these new ideas and when it when DSI is so intrinsically linked with cryptocurrencies uh, it it mars the name almost and for a lot of scientists, just the idea of crypto means it's bad and therefore science with crypto is just a scam. And it's really upsetting actually because this this decentralized tool set that's being built right now is actually the key to really, really uh, opening up science to become what it should be, which is this pursuit of the truth, pursuit of knowledge, rather than this sort of bastardized, corporatized thing that it's become. Um, so the most challenging thing shouldn't be the most challenging thing, and that's to find uh, people to get excited about it because it's... I think is so exciting. So for me, it makes no sense, but, but it's part of the journey. And it's part of what we're doing at DSI World. Yeah, I understand that because last year we tried to, you know, do a lot of uh, talks and sharings about DSI and try to onboard more people. <laughs> it's re it's really hard to try to convince them or try to let them know the power of DSI. So yeah, I agree with that. Um. Okay. So. Maybe we go to the second question. This is for Jose. So on November, if you all know that there's a DCCC in Istanbul, what are the most impressive things about the event for you? If two of you have joined that, but maybe Jose will answer it from a participant perspective. this uh, even from other communities so i could talk to people that are in DeFi, in infrastructure and uh, i arrived there as a independent researcher i told everyone i was interested in this side and i was surprised that everyone knew what it was and more or less they know the the fundamentals the vision that the people in this i have so i think that's uh, to be praised to the whole community and people that uh, raise awareness about this side that is actually catching up and people are more aware on what is this side and what are we doing here. And um, another thing that I found is that uh, uh, there's even growing interest. So even during the DevConnect conference, uh, there was this news about uh, CSET resigning uh, from Binance. And then the first thing he claimed is that he would start uh, investing in uh, healthcare and uh, biotech technologies. So from then on, all the eyes shifted towards this side suddenly because people realized that science and crypto have a strong use case and it's actually something of interest for investors and uh, people in other industries now. Wow, that's wonderful because I very pitifully missed the event. So very happy to hear you. <laughs> 
uh, experience. And just now, I have <laughs> I have read a news that CZ is going to invest in DCI too. So DCI has a bright future. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so maybe we will go to the third question. This is for. Uh, Josh, uh, from a co-host perspective, do you think is there an obvious trend of the nationality distribution of the on-site speakers or participants in the DCICC? Um, it's kind of an obvious trend in the same sense of distribution of uh, Web3 in general, right? Which is mostly uh, European, North American um, and sort of Chinese, Korean, uh, and kind of Australian, but um, so that there is a real lack of uh, sort of com you know people in DSI who are coming to present their projects um, from areas such as South America, from areas such as Africa, the entirety of Africa, um, from areas such as like more sort of rural places within China, within uh, this sort of like Southeast Asian states like Thailand and Vietnam, etc. Um, that it's it's pretty much the same distribution that you'd expect at any sort of tech based conference. Um, and it's a shame because um, obviously the diverse opinions and the diverse perspectives from around the world is what science is going to really thrive on, right? Is the, that, that sort of knowledge that local people know about their local world and their local fauna and flora and their local science that people from the other side of the world don't know. And that innovation is going to be unlocked really, really powerfully with these new tools that we're building to kind of proliferate access to science through DSI. Um, yeah, I think that uh, the, the one thing that did shock me actually was how few sort of Indian participants there were. And this is something mm -hmm. that I've been speaking a lot about uh, to some you know Indian people is that why are why is the Indian community not so involved? And I think it's because DSI is actually just really unknown in, D in India. And we wanted to do a conference there, but had to cancel it sadly at the last minute because we, we couldn't get the resources together. But um, so I think India is really rife for innovation in DSI in particular because they have such a large technical, technically skilled and um, skilled in in all aspects of science population that DSI yeah. could be really powerful there. And you know, different laws around data and how you handle medical data and things like this um, are going to be really powerful for that as well. So the, the distribution was as you'd expect, but unfortunately, that's not good enough for us, which is why we want to do through DSI World through our world of DSI conference circuit, which is going around the world, we plan to incubate DSI in as many countries as possible to, so that maybe next year when you ask me that question, I could say everybody's yeah. happy, which is great. Okay, so um, what kind of things are you going to incubate, like projects or like funding uh, institution? Or... Yeah, so we want to start by incubating a community in that place. So we go to... Okay. For example, we go to Taipei, then we incubate a DSI Taipei community. And the idea for that would be that we provide tools and resources and potentially funding um, and just our general support and our networks, et cetera, uh, to make this community you know, meet and on a week, on a monthly basis and, and maybe give them some resources and just sort of help mm -hmm. organize them a little bit. Um, but ultimately, it's down to the community themselves. When they've incubated themselves, then they become, you know, every month they meet and all these great ideas happen. Then when projects start coming out, DSI World can directly in, uh, directly support those projects, either, again, by funding, potentially, but more than anything through partnerships and access to the network and shouting them out and signal boosting generally. We are actually uh, raising funds right now. Um, mm -hmm. And the the ambition that we have is that when we do, if we raise sufficient, then we can actually financially support some of these projects. But for the moment, that's absolutely not possible because we're just a startup. <laughs> um, although, although we're doing really great stuff, uh, like we're we're walk towing the line on the budget consistently. So <laughs> when, we, um, when we get a bit more money, and I think that that's when we'll start to support projects on a funding basis. And to be honest with you, Lauren, like the the space is so rife for innovation that if you invest in anything in this space in the coming mm -hmm. year or two i think it's going to be a good bet so we're we're quite excited to be able to do that as a, as a as a collective yeah so um yeah i heard that the gg15 is uh, uh you know decide beta round beta round and that working group is going to uh, host another round of decide so there are also ways 
funds for desired communities. And if you want to incubate some communities in Asia, just find Swift. <laughs> he is organizing the desired Asia now. Yeah. So, okay. so thank you, Laura. <laughs> yes. Yeah, Swift and I have been talking on Telegram, and I'm going to be. I, I hear that he lives nearby now, so I'm going to be reaching out to Swift. <laughs> Just to, for anyone listening, I used to live in Chongqing, okay, and I'm really desperate to go back to Chongqing and do a conference. Chongqing. Chongqing. And it's it, oh. it, it hot pot. Yeah, go get a hot pot <laughs> and do a conference there. For hot sure. pot. Oh, yeah, Chongqing is famous in hot pot. Yeah. Thing, you want to do D side and tell me, and we will uh, uh, we'll do that. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. When, um, when you come to uh, come to Chongqing, yeah, Lauren and I will help to to connect all the friends, <laughs> which is in <laughs> Asia. Yeah. Okay. So maybe we come to the last question. And uh, by the way, Jose, have you ever tried hot pot? <laughs> maybe. Next time, if we have some opportunities, we can have <laughs> hot pot together. So the last question is for Jose. What are your expressions and suggestions regarding the development of this site in Asia? Um, yeah. Yeah, so I think for any DSI community, what's most important, especially if it's a regional community like DSI Asia, is to focus mm -hmm. on the fundamentals and uh, the problems that the scientists in that region have. So, because this at the end tries to bridge uh, Web3 solutions to scientific problems, it's not the same the problems that maybe uh, communities of scientists from Latin America or Europe have as compared to communities from Asia. So the most important is to understand what are the main problems in uh, in the regional community you want to engage with and then provide the uh, appropriate solutions for them. And of course, um, yeah, uh, the mainly this, I think the, the biggest challenge it has is to gain scientific adoption from scientists themselves, especially because we have this bad reputation from crypto that people associate to scams and stuff. So try to focus on how this I can uh, solve their problems instead of uh, focusing on crypto related things or Web3 that at the end, the average science user is not going to care about. They care that you can provide uh, maybe more transparent or more efficient uh, technology mm -hmm. instead of uh, uh, really focusing on that is Web3 or that is crypto, that this can bring sometimes, especially scientists that are very traditional people uh, backwards in order to engage with big companies or big universities. I think there should be a focus on what functionalities really has. Yeah, thanks. So, yeah, for design communities, there was a there's a still a long way to go, and we are also trying to do more things like Swift, Swift, Swift has mentioned. We try to do more things about education to uh, let people know the power of design, the power of blockchain, and what we can use this technology to uh, empower technology, empower research. Um, and in Uncommerce, we are also um, hosting some education program like the Cyclone program to onboard more people to our to Web3 to design field. And this like, keeps happening in our communities. Um, just back to the most challenging things for Josh, how to let people know design, how to let, let them accept design. Yeah, so that's all my questions. Um, Swift, do you have any more questions? Um, no, yeah, yeah. Thanks for uh, Josh, thanks for Josh, and thanks for uh, Lawrence. That yeah, that is the uh, biggest problems that uh, how to unbrush thing the scientists, especially because uh, most of people will believe that uh, crypto may equals to the scam at this moment because there's a lot of lots of the bad news 
and is the the parts that we have to tackle. So therefore, uh, yeah, very happy to see that uh, Uncommon is hosting a, a co-learning a design uh, section in Mandarin. So therefore, we can so and uh, therefore we can see different kinds of Asia pack area can using their own language in the education. So that make uh make things a little bit easier to understand for the for the local people. Yeah. Can I say one more thing? Sorry, just on this. Um, I think it's really important that we, as a community uh, in DSI mm-hmm. in particular, really understand that um public goods funding is a wonderful resource but it should not be considered the primary resource for DSI and D scientists and funding research. So when you talk to scientists and people trying to onboard them, rather than sort of saying, oh, you can access all these great funds such as Gitcoin or these public goods funds, um, whilst that is attractive and that is true to an extent, I think it's an incredibly unsustainable model for moving science over to DSI, right? Um, mm-hmm. you know, the institutions that give grants out are backed by government states. Right. There's no amount of money in the decentralized infrastructure that's going to fund, you know, Gitcoin grants to the extent that science needs. Um, so what really needs to be done is to change the entire economy of doing science and being a scientist such that you can yeah. fund your own science or you can build businesses out of the science that you're creating. And so that's something that's really important, I think, when we talk about it is that, yeah, tell scientists that there's all these things on offer and that they might find funding. Sure, they might. Uh, but more, I would say that the messaging is we need scientists to understand that they can actually become almost entrepreneurs themselves or join forces with people that can help them do that uh, such that they can actually create sustainable business models for themselves and then fund their science that way. Yeah, I totally agree because there should be a self-sustainable mechanism for the whole design, not just f- you try to find all those resources, all those fundings from Bitcoin, from this good, good uh, organizations. Yeah. So do you have anything to add here? Our session is going to close and maybe you can keep in touch. And uh, Uncommons has a lot of, you know, decide. Uh, discussions and all these CSA communities in Asia. So if Design World is going to incubate or support all these communities, we can keep in touch. Yeah. Absolutely. Please, Um, my telegram, I'll, I'll send it to you. You have it. So let's talk on that. <laughs> yeah, of course. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for hosting us. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you so much for Josh and Jose. And uh, what's your time? What's your time now? I'm not sure about your time zone. <laughs> 6 p.m. here. 6 7 p.m. PM. Um, okay, it's not a too late time. Actually, it's already 2 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> it's already 2 a.m. now. Ooh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Very good Chinese. Okay, maybe uh, a common session is going to close here. And thank you so much for your participation and if you have any questions just contact me in telegram okay moderator our session is is going to end